For Louisiana vs. All Y'all, Jared Roser here with BR Prods, Chester Boucher, who has kind of over the last couple of years been like de facto women's basketball slash Kim Mulkey guest for Louisiana vs. All Y'all. Uh, and, and she's got a special guest with her there already to start off. Ch- Chessa, how are you and, and who you got with you? And this is Scout. We're doing good. We're here at the house. I've been sick, so they've been taking care of me. And of course, they always want camera time because they're needy. So this is Scout. I'm sure Shortstop will jump in here in a minute because he's going to be like, why am I not in this mom? So they say hello. <laughs> you, you mentioned being being a little bit under the weather. You come back from a whirlwind weekend up in Dallas watching LSU the Lady Tigers win the first basketball national championship for either LSU program. And just, I mean, a, an incredible end to an incredible season. Just take me through that final four experience. You're somebody who obviously the, the sport of women's basketball is near and dear to your heart with your background. Kim Mulkey, the second year head coach at LSU is someone that, that you've been around and looked up to since you were a, a very young basketball player yourself to see the, the home state team uh, with the home state coach pull off the, the run that they did and cap it all off with, with rings and trophies. What was that like to cover? It's by far one of the top sporting events that I've covered in my career. And I was part of that Joe Burrow national championship run as well. And that was, a beautiful thing to see, but what Kim Mulkey has done in this turnaround in year two, I don't think anybody anticipated her winning a national championship in year two, even though, you know, I kind of said that a little bit last time. Um, no, not really, but uh, yeah, it was just unbelievable and incredible. And just, they really took on that underdog role this year and nine new pieces, only one returning starter and Alexis Morris and, you're like, you know, what can this team really do? And, you know, they got a lot of hate, a lot of criticism for their soft non-conference schedule, even calling it a cupcake schedule. And it's like, have they really played anybody? And so then they go to South Carolina, laid an egg there in South Carolina, got a little embarrassed. But I think that was the game they really needed. And it was more of a wake-up call of like, yeah, we've been coasting is a nice way to put it. Like they hadn't really been challenged up to that point. And I think they needed that game to really be like, okay, we're good, but we're not on that national championship level. So we have work to do. And I think after that game, I know that Angel Reese went back. She only had four offensive boards, put that up on our locker and was like determined not to have another game like that. And I think the narrative for this team for a majority of the season was it's all about Angel Reese. It's Angel Reese. It's the Angel Reese show. But I think what we saw in that, in that NCAA tournament run was that when they needed other players to step up, they did. And I think it wasn't just Alexis Morris and it wasn't just Angel Reese. You saw, you know, Flage Johnson have a big game in the tournament. You saw, which for me, I think Ladeja Williams is the unsung hero of this team. I think she took a lot of the brunt of when Angel was getting double teamed. She stepped up and she had some, I mean, she had her best career game in the tournament. So I think, you just had a lot of pieces step up and play, you know, maybe better than you anticipated them to or better than what you had seen all year. But that's the magic with Kim Mulkey. She always is able to get the best out of players. And I think that's what we saw this year. And I mean, the recruiting class that she's bringing in, the number one recruiting class in the country, um, just signed a girl out of Lafayette today, the number one recruit in the state of Louisiana. I just think she is building a dynasty and to see her get emotional when Kim doesn't typically get emotional, like she might, you know, shed a tear winning a national championship for, but for her to break down almost in the minute 30 mark was like, it was a moment and one that I will never forget because for Kim, not everybody gets to see that side of her and not everybody gets to see the more emotional, the more human side of Kim Mulkey. And I think with her being back in her home state, I think with her grandkids have really softened her up a little bit. And I just think to see that side and what she was able to accomplish and to slay that dragon that nobody's been able to do for men or women is just such a remarkable feat in just year two. And it just, it shows what she brings to the table. You hit to some degree on, 
a lot of things that I'm going to ask you in a little bit more detail <laughs> all the, all the way through what, what do the next few years potentially look like uh, with, with this already accomplished. But you mentioned, we talked April 25th, 2021, how confident were you and how quickly could she have this team in national championship contention? And you said from your background and knowing her, your heart wanted to say two years, but you didn't know how long it would take to get some recruiting classes in. Obviously we've seen how much bigger the transfer portal has become in college sports since then. And and so that kind of expedites some things, but the way that this season went, you mentioned South Carolina is a wake up call, but in the wake of that game, when did it start to click to you that, okay, they, they had that bad showing that Sunday against South Carolina, but when did you feel like it clicked in your mind that, okay, this actually could be a team that, that gets to that stage this year and, and has a chance, even if a South Carolina is waiting there, maybe this is a little bit of a different team come March after going through that experience. I think for me, the game that really said the most was the Georgia game. And that was the only overtime game that they had, but it was, And the way which they won that game, one, the last, like the fourth quarter, they basically tried to give it away, but to adjust and make the plays down the stretch, it was like, okay, this team's got something. And I was like, for me, the entire season, it was like, if they could just get a better, you know, better offensive production from a guard, so it's not just the Alexis Morris and Angel Reese. And I was like, maybe they could really make a push because the whole thing with South Carolina was they had so much depth and so much, so much experience. Kim Mulkey brought in LaDasia Williams, veteran. She had Angel Reese. She's been in the tournament two years in a row. Alexis Morris has had experience. So it's one of those things of like, they've got experience, just that missing piece of what guard is really going to step up. So for me, it was just the Georgia game of like, this team could really make a splash. I was stunned when they got booted out of the SEC tournament with that, the way that they kind of collapsed there in the third quarter against Tennessee. So it was like, man, if they could just put these pieces together and play a complete game, they could be scary. And I think that's what we saw in the tournament early on when they faced Michigan. Michigan, I'll be honest, that matchup really, I like did not sleep well the night before because I was like, man, Michigan is big. They're experienced. They got veterans. They've got monsters down low. They've got great guard play. I was like, this is going to be a tough one, but to see, so this is shortstop. He had to be up in there. (laughs) Um, No, but to see for Michigan, I was like, man, to see the defensive performance and them to put it together. I was like, bruh, I don't know any team that's going to be able to stop them if they keep playing like this in the tournament. And that's exactly what we saw. And the crazy thing is they didn't shoot the ball well for a majority of the tournament. And for them to have, I don't want to say cruised because it wasn't, you know, just blowouts every game, but to like put together the games that they put together and the, the wins so dominantly against some of the teams that I didn't expect them to blow out. I was like, Oh, Oh, this is what we do. And this is where we're going this year. Like, yeah, it, it's it's still almost like a blur to me that they pulled it off just because, let's be honest, nobody saw – nobody. I mean, even if you ask Kim, I think Kim would say, no, I didn't see us win a national championship this year. Yeah. And I just think that speaks volumes. Um, I I lost money on Sunday because I, I didn't know how it was going to shake out in terms of win or lose, but I in no way thought – that they were going to come out and score 102 and that would not be able to miss from the perimeter. I thought they would control things inside and it could be interesting, but they were going to have to, they were going to muck things up and have to win a game that was maybe, you know, more in the the sixties or low seventies or or something along those lines. And Jasmine Carson comes out and out shoots Caitlin Clark in the first half. Um, I don't know if, if you looked at leading into that game, but, From her seven three-point performance in February against Florida, she had hit only six of 35 since then, had seven Ofer games, and then comes out and shoots lights out in the biggest stage of her life. You mentioned Kim having players ready in the moments that they need to be ready. How shocked were you that that was Jasmine Carson's moment to that degree, and and how much of a game changer was that in the first half of that game? 
Oh, that was huge. To be honest, I had said this all season long. Jasmine Carson is a pure shooter and she's a great shooter, but she had been so inconsistent. It was like you talked about that Florida performance, seven threes. You were like, okay, I see you. And then the next game, she, I mean, she threw it up. It would barely even hit the backboard. Like it was so off that I was like, man, if she would just be more consistent, it'd be a game plan. It's ironic that you brought all that up talking about the Iowa matchup. Cause for me, what I said going in that game plan was, they don't have any depth in the post. And I was like, if they can get Monica in some foul trouble early on, both Angel and Ladeja could go to work and really make a statement. And But I also said they have to be able to shoot and make some shots. I mean, going in that ball game, LSU was shooting 19% from the three. Yeah. Ended up shooting 65% from three. Like, nobody envisioned that. So, yeah, I was – I was stunned. Um, it was impressive to me that Jasmine came off the bench and was just on fire. But throughout this tournament run, she didn't start, which was weird because in the regular season, she started a majority of the games. But Kim made the call to start Kateri Poole because she's bigger. She's a more defensive threat as opposed to Carson. So I understood it. I got it. Um, I feel like Kim wanted to really be more physical and make it you know, show them, like, can y'all hang with this physicality? Because I don't think they could. I mean, I think that's what we saw. A majority of it, aside from shooting, was that they weren't used to that bump and just physical domination that LSU has been accustomed to in the SEC. So, yeah, to see Jasmine go off like that and to have the game um, after, I think it was one of, it might have been the Michigan game, I asked him, like, what she had seen from Jasmine. And she said, to be honest, like she's not shooting well in the postseason, but this is by far her most productive offensive season she's ever had. And I was surprised. And she was like, I know it doesn't look like that on paper, but and she explained just how she had struggled. She kind of gets in her head and doesn't really get into a rhythm. And um, she's like, you know, I have belief in her and I know that when we need her, she's going to step up. And I was like, OK. And so it was one of those to call her name and to come out there. I had not seen a shooting performance like that in the tournament in ages. And it was one of those of just like, she probably could have gone like this and like thrown the ball. She was just so money. I've only had one game like that. That was back in the day playing AU ball. I hit eight threes, but it was, it's one of those nights that she'll never forget. It's one of the most powerful moments. Cause you're like, I'm unstoppable. Like it didn't, it doesn't matter what you do. You're going to be able to score. And it's, I mean, we saw that. It was incredible. She didn't miss her first shot until the fourth quarter. Like, But LSU needed that. If you would have told me that they got into a shootout with Iowa, I would have been like, oh, I wouldn't take some of the natty. Here, Jasmine Carson's like, not so fast, hold my beer, and gets it done. Like, <laughs> incredible. <laughs> yeah, I had gone unders on first half game totals. I went under on Caitlin Clark three-pointers because I just, I just thought it was going to be a slower – grindier game yep. than than ended up being and i realized quickly that that money was was down the drain and i could just watch as a, a spectator without considering that at all yep. um 9.9 .9 million viewers uh peaking at 12.6 the most espn plus has ever had in, in its history for a college sporting event men's or women's uh, a couple million more than the Alabama LSU overtime football game in the fall. How huge has this sport grown just in the past year and certainly the past five years or so to be at a point where you see those numbers, you see Magic Johnson and Samuel L. Jackson tweeting about it uh, on top of all the WNBA stars that were there, Dirt, hometown Dirk, but Powell Gasol, it seemed like, celebrities both basketball and otherwise were were tuned in as was the country to some degree coast to coast i mean how how big has this sport grown just in again the last year two five if you want to look even farther it has absolutely exploded and it's so exciting to see because obviously me being a former athlete we always felt like we never got recognition it didn't matter what we did that the eyes weren't there and it was just like oh well, we're doing what we can, like it is what it is. But I think for ESPN to have the broadcast 
on different channels, on different avenues really helped, you know, bring a lot more eyes and more exposure on the game. And I think that's what they've needed for forever. I will tell you, I went out to Greenville for the SEC tournament plus the NCAA tournament. And I have never been around a town that, I mean, even in my Uber, the Uber was like, oh, and he was talking college women's basketball to me. The next Uber would come up and he's like, oh, you're fr-. like, I have never been around the game where so many people were engaged and knew what they were talking about. Like, it's one thing to be like, oh, the tournament's going on, but yeah. for people to follow it. But I think social media, aside from all the BS that we have to deal with, I think that it's helped people be more engaged and be more um, exposed to it. And I think it's only going to grow from there. But I also think when you have superstars like Caitlin Clark, like Angel Reese, like Alexis Morris, when you have eyes on the game because they, they play a different brand of basketball and it's exciting and it's fun and it's not the same powerhouses like we're accustomed to seeing year in and year out, I think it only makes the game better. And I think that's what we're seeing, but also – these athletes are taking it response like they're they feel responsible for the product that they put out there and to be a role model for girls that are watching them and I think that's really taking form and taking shape and showing like that they're proud of what they're doing and they're proud of you know being a part of growing the game and it's just it's so exciting to see because again when I was growing up I mean, you couldn't just turn on the channel. It was it was a challenge to watch these games. You had to make sure you were at home at a certain time. So I think just the exposure and, you know, ESPN actually embracing women's basketball, having college game day there and, you know, having more eyes on them and taking advantage of it, like, that's only going to help in the long run. And I think we're seeing essentially the reason why it is growing is because they are putting in that effort. You mentioned – some of the the social media nonsense that we texted about some of that earlier in the week. And it was such a weird gift and a curse, double-edged sword type of thing to me to realize this many people are paying attention, but also so much of the conversation got hijacked into this final seconds. Yeah. Angel Reese can't see me motion to Caitlin Clark. How did you read or take some of that? I- I'm sure you know, it, it's exciting to have that many people talking about it, but it's it's frustrating as well, I'm sure, to, to see that become such a focal point of that conversation. Yeah, to me, it was just silly because one, like people are acting like women aren't allowed to trash talk. Why? Why, why is that even a thing? Because we're missing an appendage. We can't say what we feel like. That's so silly to me. And so to see the game and to see – what was on display. I mean, one of the most exciting games, national championships I've ever watched. If the referees would have chilled out a little bit, it would have been like top tier, the best one. But to see so many eyes and to see just people in awe, I will tell you that was one of the coolest environments. When I, I mean, Iowa fans were going nuts. LSU fan, it was back and forth back. It felt like an, an SEC national championship football game, which is, very weird to say because women's basketball hasn't been on that level. They haven't had the opportunity to have that type of atmosphere, that type of crowd. So to see that and then basically them taking away from the bigger picture was like, come on, like get your eyes off of that. And I think it would be one thing if that was like the first time that Angel Reese had said anything, but it's not. But even more so, her and Kayla Clark go back from when Angel Reese was at Maryland and they were trash talking then. So like, don't make it a, she came for her. No, they were both running their mouth. They both played great basketball and one was going to win and one was going to lose. And that's what happened. Regardless of whoever was going to win, it shouldn't matter. Like just let them play the game, let them play the way they want to play and let them be free. And I think that's, I mean, it's so dumb for them to try to criticize Angel and it's so dumb. I'm glad that Caitlin cleared the air and was like, no, she shouldn't be criticized for that because she shouldn't. Like, girls should be able to do just like the boys. Point blank here. Just because we can't dunk doesn't mean anything else. That was an incredible display of shooting that we did not anticipate, but it was fun basketball. And I think it's for the bigger picture, 
like quit trying to narrow it down and make it more than what it is. It was a great basketball game against two elite teams, and we saw the best of the best. That from noted trash talker Chessa Boucher as as a take <laughs> there. And look, the first time that you chatted when I was first starting this little channel a couple years ago during the pandemic we were watching the last dance kind of wind through and i'm curious how many people complained on social media about angel reese and or caitlin clark that had mentioned at some point missing the rivalries of the 90s nba and not liking the banana boat buddy buddy nba of today but then were quick to snap at some of the trash talking in the women's game was just an aspect that that I considered through the wake of some of that. Um, And a lot of the reaction on social media, or, you know, at least a a portion of it took on this racial type aspect. And I saw during the game, Natasha cloud WNBA champion with the mystics in 19 uh, and all WNBA defensive player this past year said that she felt that the crowd had a racial charge to it. Did you feel that from your perspective, at the actual arena with with the way some of the fans were interacting or was that not something that that you caught I didn't catch that but also I'm a little on the blind side to that because I played ball all my life I was for a majority of my life was the only white girl so like unless something was directed at me it was just something that I had been accustomed to so I didn't really feel that way I will tell you the crowd differences were very obvious that Iowa fans were very white. And here we have Baton Rouge, the whole state of Louisiana, which is a melting pot of everything was there. So I could understand where she might feel like the crowd was different in that aspect, but I didn't feel like it took on a racial, um, a racial side in the fact of like how, the crowd was cheering or any of that. Mm-hmm. But again, it was obvious, like Iowa fans, they were all dressed in black, but they were all majority white. <laughs> and then you have LSU fans that are everywhere with everything. And so, yeah, I didn't, I didn't feel that at all. Yeah. There had been kind of on a less serious side of it, the the joking lead up of the, the Iowa high school musical clip yep. versus LSU listening to Boosie and so there were kind of joking aspects going in but that was Natasha Clouds was the one tweet that I saw of that nature from the game that I I was kind of curious about what the perspective was actually being there in any event I mean you mentioned okay year two they've won a national championship and it was maybe a little bit earlier than than Kim Mulkey expected than a lot of people potentially expected and now the you know the success that they've had before having full recruiting cycles in. And now they've got Michaela Williams and company and a number one class coming in for this year. They just had Jada Richard from Lafayette Christian announce her commitment a few hours ago uh, for that 24 class. Uh, I mean, no pressure, Kim Mulkey and company, but what do the next couple of years look like? If, if you're looking at this year two through year five or six, um, sh- she was quick to caution don't expect it every year. It's not easy. And it's increasingly difficult in women's basketball where there's more parity as more attention comes. What can they accomplish now moving forward? I'm interested to see how the roles reverse because this year they were the underdog. They felt like they were disrespected. Now I've already seen in preseason polls that they're number one obviously for winning the national championship. So I'm very interested to see how they go from playing that underdog role to now being the hunted. Um, I think with the talent they're bringing in, I will say um, it worries me a little bit losing um, Deja Williams and a veteran post player like that, the true post player. I think Angel Reese is a great forward. She's not necessarily that true post Um I think you're going to lose some of that presence down low. Yeah, you have um, Samaya Smith, who's a freshman, who will be a sophomore, but she needs to put on some weight and, you know, get to the gym and do a whole lot because there's – you can't really compare a true freshman like that with LaDesia Williams, the veteran leadership. Her post moves were just immaculate. Like, watching her – I get excited for two things. 
a great pass and a great move. And there were so many times where I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh, because just like Ladesia, her footwork and the, her up and under just would get me fired up. So um, I think that's going to be one of the biggest keys. I know a girl from Tennessee, is it uh, Delisario or Dela? It's some, you know who I'm talking yeah. about? She's yeah, coming I know who in. you're talking about. I, I don't, outside of Louisiana recruits, I don't know, yep. I don't know no, their I names feel as well. Right there. And I'm not great with the uh, whole Hispanic names either, either. So I'm sure I butchered her name and I apologize. But yeah, so it's to me, it's you just need to get some, some more veteran post play. And then, of course, you are losing Alexis Morris, a big key piece of this offense this year. But Michaela Williams is a stud from Bossier City from Parkway. I'm excited to see her play. I've only seen a few highlights, but to see what she has done on the high school level is exciting. But yeah, it's I to me, I just it's hard for me to bet against Kim because she is a phenomenal recruiter and she is extremely competitive. And knowing that she set the bar so high in year two, she is not going to be okay if they have a letdown year in year three. And I'm not saying they're going to go win a national championship. I'm saying if you're not in the mix and you're not dominating like they did this past year, he is not going to be okay with that. And I don't want to be in the same locker room with Kim Mulkey when she's disappointed because that's one of the worst. Just I don't want to be around it. It's a lot. It's, mm, I'll be okay. So, uh, yeah, to me, though, I just – I'm, I'm so confident in Kim and this coaching staff and their ability to bring in recruits that I don't really, I feel like they're going to be in the mix for at least however much longer Kim is in coaching. Cause she has said like, this is where she's going to end her career. There was a question in, in post game after the, the championship game of whether a run like this makes her more comfortable, potentially stepping away sooner now that she's brought this title to Louisiana or if it just makes her that much hungrier to to keep at it longer term, she naturally deflected that some. Do you have any any feel for that of whether having success maybe sooner than she anticipated here, if that's something that kind of makes it easier to retire when she feels that that's time or makes it easier to think, okay, well, we already did this. Let me go do it again and again. Yeah, I feel like the second part of that is it- – <laughs> Kim, her, her nature and how she is, she's not okay with just, like, I know that they just won, and I know that she's having to do all these appearances, but I also know it's probably eating at her, like, hey, we got to get back on that recruiting trail. Hey, we, she is just one of the most competitive people I've ever been around, and I don't think early success is going to make it easier for her to retire sooner than later. I think, again, she's going to be hungry, and she's going to be ready to be out there and to prove some people like, oh, y'all think this is a fluke. Y'all think that I just won my fourth national championship and I'm okay with just having four. Like, no, no, she's not made that way. She doesn't coach that way. Her teams don't play that way. So, yeah, I think I think this year from what I've seen and what I know of them, what they're bringing in, now I think they're going to br- grab some people in the transfer portal and it's going to be like, Okay, I see you. So, yeah, I think this next year is – I'm not saying they're going to finish, what, 34-2 and two and win a national championship, but I am saying they're going to make a statement, and it's going to be an even bigger statement just because it is year three, and Kim doesn't want people to think it's just a fluke. Like, that's how she is. Four moves her in to loan possession of third place on the women's side – Gino Oriyama, UConn with 11, Pat Summit at Tennessee with eight, Kim at two different schools now with four moving ahead of uh, Tara Vanderveer at, at Stanford. Also separates her from some, from some folks on the men's side. She's in the top six total on both sides. John Wooden, 10, Coach K, five, eight off her up uh, right there with, with four with Kentucky. Uh, Matt Moscona tweeted earlier this week that he thinks that winning it at a, a different school and doing so so quickly – winning the first at LSU makes her the greatest women's college basketball coach in his opinion, despite some of those numbers, you're already kind of wincing that you think it it looks like you think that's a little bit premature. What's your thoughts on, on her kind of stature and and what winning at a a second school does for her in terms of where she ranks up historically with some of these other big names. 
I think winning at a second school really solidifies that she's a winner and that she knows how to win and to get get it done. I think the downfall, though, to that is that Gino did it at UConn and only at UConn. Pat did it at Tennessee, built that program. So it's not really in the same ballpark. It's not fair to say, oh, well, she skips them because she left a dynasty to build a new dynasty. I don't think um, – in, if a comparison wise, I don't think that is fair. That's not on the equal playing field because, again, I think it's commendable. Nobody expected her to leave Baylor. I didn't personally. Um, she came here. She's starting to build this powerhouse, this dynasty, even though you ask her that. And she's like, oh, no, don't say that. But she, you know, she's doing. But yeah, I wouldn't. It, it, I, you know me, and I think the world of her. I grew up a huge fan. I idolized her. I think she's a phenomenal coach. I think she's in the top three by far. But I think she's got to win a few more championships in order to, you know, it be on a, a level playing field because most coaches are known for winning championships, not just winning ball games. Yeah. Well, Chessa, that's all I've got for you. And again, I certainly appreciate you taking some time to kind of break it all down, even though you're still a little bit under the the weather. Um, and certainly a big shout out to Scout and Shortstop as well for their contributions. They they like some airtime. I can't help that. I don't know where they get it from. <laughs> Again, she's Chessa Boucher from BR Proud with uh, assists from Scout and Shortstop and for Louisiana versus all y'all, Jarrett Roser.